You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. We ain't seen nothing yet for India in space, baby. India is not resting on their lunar laurels. Chandrayaan 3 was a great success. So what's next after landing and roving around the moon? Why human spaceflight, of course. Expect to see some crucial test flights for ISRO's planned human spaceflight missions as soon as next month. T-minus. Today is September 18th, 2023. Happy birthday to the U.S. Air Force. I'm Maria Varmazas, and this is T Minus. India moves up its Gaganyan human spaceflight program. Stoke Space conducts a vertical takeoff and landing developmental test flight of its reusable second stage rocket. Varda continues to fight for re entry of its vehicle. And our guest today is Tom Murata, CEO of The Spaceport Company. Stay with us. Now let's take a look at today's Intel briefing. According to an update in Reuters today, a key flight test for ISRO's first crewed space mission is happening as soon as this October. Astronaut testing is already underway for four crew members of the Gaganyan mission, which will send the crew to a 400-kilometer low-Earth orbit for three days aboard a human habitable space capsule. And ISRO says while they aren't sharing a timeline for this, if all goes well in testing next month, it is possible that we could see India's first crewed human spaceflight happening before the end of this year. On Friday's show, we discussed Stoke Space's static fire test of their second stage rocket engine and stated that next up was a test launch. And lo and behold, the Washington-based company delivered already. Stoke Space conducted a vertical takeoff and vertical landing developmental test flight of the reusable second stage rocket. And during the test, the company launched the Hopper test vehicle to an altitude of 30 feet and landed it at its planned landing zone following 15 seconds of flight. The aim of the test was to demonstrate Stokes' novel hydrogen-oxygen engine, regeneratively cooled heat shield, and differential throttle thrust vector control system. The company says it successfully completed all of the planned objectives. And now the company plans to design and build a rocket that is 100% reusable with a 24-hour turnaround. And to reach that goal, Stoke will now continue moving through its development program by increasing focus on the reusable first stage. We're all feeling for Varda space here at T-minus this week after they failed to secure the support from the Air Force and the FAA to land its capsule at a Utah training area. 
The company took to the social media platform X to say that their efforts to bring their in-space manufacturing vehicle back to Earth have failed thus far. The company's statement read, quote, It was originally designed for a full year on orbit if needed. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with our government partners to bring our capsule back to Earth as soon as possible. The company's application for a commercial space license was also denied by the FAA. So we do hope that the company finds alternative plans soon. Ten satellites that incorporated Terran orbital buses have been deployed in low Earth orbit following a September 2, 2023 launch. Those 10 satellites are part of the Tranche Zero transport layer of the Space Development Agency's proliferated warfighter space architecture. Terran Orbital manufactured the buses for Lockheed Martin for payload integration and delivery to the Space Development Agency. Terran Orbital is producing 42 satellite buses for Lockheed Martin, which will deliver 42 Tranche 1 transport layer satellites for the SDA to be launched in 2024. The title of Chief Master Sergeant of the U.S. Space Force changed hands for the first time last week as Roger Toberman retired and passed the mantle on to John Bentevegna in a ceremony at Joint Base Andrews, Maryland. Bentevegna says he'll spend his first 90 days listening to guardians and airmen at commands worldwide, taking note of what he learns and using that to shape an agenda for the time that follows. NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara and Roscosmos cosmonauts Oleg Kokonenko and Nikolai Chubb blasted off from Kazakhstan on Friday and docked at the International Space Station three hours later. O'Hara will spend six months on the ISS, while Kokonenko and Chubb will spend a year in orbit. The trio joins seven station residents from the U.S., Russia, Denmark, and Japan. As if we all need a daily reminder of why space is important for life here on Earth, scientists in the UK have used Earth observation satellites to detect a massive methane leak for the first time. Imagery captured by satellite company GHGSat shows plumes of the greenhouse gas coming from a pipeline in Gloucestershire. Although the discovery is from March of this year, the information has only just been made public. Experts are looking into the cause of the leak, but believe it's due to aging infrastructure. On the sidelines of World Satellite Business Week in Paris last week, Samara Sense, CubeSpace, and Sodern signed a memorandum of understanding on advancing Earth observation. According to Space in Africa, the agreement between the South African and French companies will enhance collaborative efforts to ensure the successful execution of all Earth observation-based missions. And Malaysia is looking to develop a spaceport. The Science, Technology, and Innovation Ministry and Malaysian Space Agency, known as MISA, are studying the feasibility of establishing a space launch site with a focus on business development. Malaysia's Science, Technology, and Innovation Minister Chong Lee Kang said in a statement that Malaysia's unique geographical position being located near the equator gives us an advantage in developing the space launching facility, with far more competitive operating costs. The minister also said that they are in talks with several companies that are keen on getting involved in the development. And that concludes our briefing for today. You can find links to further reading on all the stories we've mentioned in our show notes. We've also included some opinion pieces, one on solar farms in space, one on balancing space superiority and space services to sustain the U.S. Joint Force, and the last on NASA officials' reaction to Starship. They're all at space.n2k.com, and just click on this episode. Hey, T-Minus crew, every Monday we produce a written intelligence roundup. It's called Signals and Space. And if you happen to miss any T-Minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signal, no noise. You can sign up for Signals in Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. 
As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Our returning guest today is Tom Murata, CEO of The Spaceport Company. Now, Tom first joined us on the show in April, and so much has happened since then. So I asked Tom to give us an update on all that's gone on since we last spoke. Sure, sure. So in the five months since we last spoke, we've hit a number of key milestones at the Spaceport Company. First and foremost, we tested our Seabase platform back in May. We leased a a vessel, a ship. We modified it and we launched four rockets in one day in the Gulf of Mexico, proving you can do serious rocketry at sea uh, on a shoestring budget. That was internal research and development funding. Those were sounding rockets. It was a subscale prototype, uh, but that was the first time that a rocket had ever been launched in U.S. waters, in U.S. airspace. Um, I want to recognize all of our partners, um, our LIFPO provider, EBI, our rocket provider, Evolution Space, the FAA, the Coast Guard, the Air Force. They helped, they let us use their airspace. So it was very nice. So we had a lot of help doing that. And, uh, and it was a great, it was a great accomplishment. Very quickly on the heels of that test, the Spaceport Company was awarded a contract from the Defense Innovation Unit, specifically a new, a relatively new group that your listeners might not be aware of, the National Security Innovation Capital, NSIC, NSIC program. It, like I said, it's relatively new, designed specifically to fund hardware for startups. So NSIC awarded us a contract to design a full-scale sea-based launch system, one capable of taking satellites all the way to orbit from anywhere in the ocean. So we're really, really grateful for our partnership with NSIC, and, and that's what we're heads down on working on now. The other thing, the third thing that I wanted to mention, it has been a busy five months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a great thing, too. It's a great thing. We've been really busy. The House passed their version of the National Defense Authorization Act, as, as you know. In it, the House instructed the DOD to begin pricing out and planning for a sea-based demonstration launch to orbit. Oh, hey. Yeah. So the DOD, yep, the Chief of Space Operations and the Defense Innovation Unit has to report to that back to the House Armed Services Committee by December 1st of this year on um, what it might cost and how long it might take and, and kind of basic questions about moving to a sea-based demonstration launch. So um, those are some of the highlights. We've had lots of other things going on here and there, but those are those are the big things that we worked on. I mean, not small things at all. Um, you are booked and blessed, as they say. That is a wonderful thing. Yeah, <laughs> so, you sure are. Yeah. Um, so you are you are hard at work right now. Yeah, I have to ask the inevitable questions of when do you think you're, we're going to see like uh, a rocket launch something to low Earth orbit? You know, I know it's it's hard to say, but yeah. Sure, it it, it is hard to say. So our our period of performance for our current contract is eighteen months which stretches out to, to next November. And that's just for design work to actually build a sea-based platform that can launch you know, a, a small satellite to orbit. We, we had previously been hoping to have something operational by Q1 of 2025. That will likely slip unless we get a lot more money really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Put it out into the universe. You never know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so uh, we are we are on schedule to complete our design on time. We do have a lot of support and interest from a variety of stakeholders, both public and private. So we're we're uh, working as hard as we can to get this thing built and operational. That's so great. I I, I forgot to ask. I should have asked earlier. Aside from me fangirling over here about how awesome it was to hear about your news in May, I'm curious what kind of reception you all got, what, what you heard from private public sector, uh, aside from maybe champagne popping. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the response was overwhelming. This is clearly, there's a lot of interest to, um, to supplement the existing launch range capacity in the United States and indeed around the world. Not only we did, did we get an overwhelming response from U.S.-based stakeholders, but also international stakeholders, because 
the problem that we're trying to solve is real. Uh, demand for launch pads continues to exceed supply. We see increasing needs for launches to orbit, uh, not only for satellites, but for all sorts of users. And all of those launches have to start at a, at a launch pad and the supply is essentially static. And in many cases, it's, it's decreasing. So we, we had an overwhelming response. We got a lot of interest. The, the trick now is to go and do it on a demonstration basis and, and start putting it together. Um, you know, building a ship is about 11 months, right? M modifying a ship is, is 11 to 12 months. Like there are some very significant and real time that's necessary to, to weld steel, to put things together, to write the code, to test it all and make sure it's working before it can be operational. Luckily, it looks like we have a lot of interest and, and a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to support us. So that, That's great. Yeah, that's something I was looking at our interview from end of March. It, it aired in April, but it was end of March when we spoke. And that was something you had addressed was, you know, we're not just we're not just looking for rocket scientists, of course, you know, <laughs> uh, so to speak, uh, so to, in a manner of speaking. But we're looking for people with a whole wide variety of skill sets. And I was curious as a follow up to hear how that was going. So it sounds like success on that front. Yes, modest success. I, I don't want to dissuade anybody who's thinking about entering the aerospace industry from not doing it. There's still plenty of opportunity. There's still uh, absolutely a need for all sorts of individuals with all sorts of skills. And uh, I will add all sorts of time and career, you know, uh, experience levels. You know, we need senior level people. We need mid-career people. We need early career people doing all sorts of things to enter the industry. No, uh, labor is still a severe challenge. Post-COVID, being able to work with people virtually is, is really, I think, the saving grace of many startups across the tech industry, definitely in, in defense. I know a lot of essentially distributed startups that are tapping talent from across the country, coast to coast. So, you know, we have people working for us literally coast to coast. Um, our web designers in, in, in Kansas, um, you know, our accountants are, are all over the place, uh, not just our technical staff. So it's, it's really helpful. But one of our goals for the next year is to bring everybody together um, you can only take an organization so far when it's distributed. So uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, like I said, establish an office here in the Northern Virginia area and perhaps in another area uh, of the country uh, closer to our hardware as well. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. And welcome back. And on to our second reminder in today's show that tech developed for space helps us here on Earth. A shape-shifting robot, which was designed to work in the extreme conditions of space, is helping first responders on Earth. And the spherical robot, which is described as squishy, conjuring images of kind of like a fluffy BB-8, is said to be able to remotely gauge hazards and plan an approach for responders even before they enter areas hit by disasters like wildfires or chemical spills, crashes, and potentially even war zones. The Squishy Robotics Company, and yes, that is their actual name, Squishy Robotics Company, are the recipients of NASA grants to help develop the vehicle's ability to use gas thrusters, which could be employed to make the system hop on areas of the moon or Mars. 
And the CEO of Squishy Robotics, Alice Agogino, said, We thought, wow, if we can do this on the moon, we could do it on Earth and save some lives. And for the record, the robot looks a bit more like an 80s fidget toy than the Star Wars droid. But we're all for more squishy robots on Earth and in space. These are the droids we're looking for. And that's it for T-Minus for September 18th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd always love to hear what you think of our podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karpf. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Maria Varmazes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.